Dodger Stadium has been wiped clean of Julio Urias. CBS does not believe LeBron James is a top 10 player in the NBA now, and the British press hate how Galaxy fans are treating Billy Sharp. Good morning. I'm James. This is your Daily Dose of Sports and Snark for the greatest sports city in the world, Los Angeles. This is the Faithful Angelino's Morning Report. So it is September 12, 2023. It is a glorious day. I'm going to spend it with the wife. I'm absolutely looking forward to it. But until I do so, until I become husband of the year, what do you say we talk a little LA sports? And if you enjoy being in the know about LA, click and clack the like button. Click and clack the subscribe button. There's a notification bell. Hit that. It'll let you know when we drop new content. Sharing is caring. Let people know we exist and comment. Man, what is not to like about being an L.A. sports fan? Am I right? So before we go through the news and notes, a look at the scoreboard. Now look, I said it's great to be an L.A. sports fan. The game at Dodger Stadium, whatever. Padres 11, Dodgers 8. When I worked for a paper, a newspaper out in Slum Diego County, those bottom feeders, the only thing they wanted in life were victories over the Raiders and victories over the Dodgers. That was their Super Bowl wrapped up inside an Olympics, wrapped up inside of an X Games. Massive excitement anytime they got a W. Congratulations, guys. Well done. Well done, Slum Diego. By the way, Mookie Betts hit his 39th home run of the year, drove in four runs. Meanwhile, today, the Dodgers continue to coast into the postseason. Lance Lynn is going to take the mound tonight against the Puds. He's 4-2 with a 4.95 ERA. Michael Waka is 11-3 with a 2.95 ERA. But staying at the ravine, when the boys returned home from their road trip, they found some not-so-subtle changes in the locker room. Julio Arias' locker is gone. Poof. Finito. They also painted, the Dodgers organization painted over every mur mural of Julio Arias in the stadium. Now, Dave Roberts was asked about it. He called it an organizational decision. He was also asked if that was an indicator that the team has moved on from the left-hander, who, by the way, had the best ERA in the National League back in 2022. Quote, I think so. I think that's kind of where we're at right now, unquote. Now, to recap, we all know this. He is alleged, Arias that is, not Dave Roberts. Arias is alleged to have gotten into a physical altercation with a lady at BMO Stadium, BMO, BMO, whatever it's called, after an LAFC match on September 3rd. Keep in mind, even though Arias is on administrative leave, he has not been suspended yet. Oh, the suspension is coming. The guy was arrested for domestic violence before. He was suspended 20 games for that. And hell, that was a misdemeanor compared to the felony charges that he's facing now. So if you consider the administrative leave, if you consider the possibility of the length of the suspension, it could keep Arias out of the Dodgers organization, not just for the end of the regular season, but for whatever length the Dodgers postseason run would be. And of course, once the Dodger season ends, Arias is a free agent. This is a prudent move by the Dodgers for a variety of reasons. It's not just whether or not the fans take a look at Arias' face on a mural and go, ah! it's not that sort of sensitivity. It's a prudent move because you know every scribe in the United States is looking forward to coming to Dodger Stadium and writing some wistful piece if the Dodgers lose. Oh, if the Dodgers only had pitching. Oh, look at that empty locker room of Julio Arias in the corner. Such a shame that they had to have Arias get a rest. You know, something like that. And then, of course, you go to the players and you're trying to goad the players into giving you an answer as to whether or not the team would be better off without Arias in the better off with Arias in the rotation. The Dodgers organization isn't stupid. They know that it's going to happen. Can't you imagine Bill Plaschke writing his tear-stained columns about, oh, if only the Dodgers, if only Arias wasn't arrested over and over again? How the Dodgers, passing these moral judgments on the Dodgers for having him on the team in the first place? 
right? So yeah, you have to wipe the slate clean. Absolutely. Now, in case you're wondering, by the way, Colton Wong got the locker. There you go. There was a story <clears throat> that broke a day or so ago about the Angels being open to trading Mike Trout. So let's do all of ourselves a favor and just cross the Dodgers off that list of teams Mike Trout could wind up on via trade. Yes, LA has prospects out the wazoo to make a trade. What makes anyone think Artie Moreno is going to trade Trout to his biggest rival? If you remember, when Trout uh, went out and he signed Albert Pujols, you saw billboards all over not just Orange County, but the city of Los Angeles, claiming that the LA Angels, the LA Angels of Anaheim, of Garden Grove, etc., etc., were the team to watch. They were LA's team now. That was wrong. Factually speaking, absolutely wrong. So now you think he's... He, there was no way that they were going to trade Shohei Otani to the Dodgers. What makes anybody think that they're going to do the same for Trout? Exactly. If the Angels actually do trade Mike Trout, I would put money in on Philly. Even San Francisco, frankly. Those guys also have some prospects somewhere in their wazoo. Just like the Dodgers have players out the wazoo. And by the way, if you're wondering, there actually is such a thing as a wazoo. I looked it up. If you get bored and you want to start a pointless fight for her, with your girlfriend, ask if you can make love to her wazoo. That's where the wazoo is. Ryan Yarborough was placed on maternity leave. Uh, it's not really a loss in the sense that he's likely a fill-in starter through the end of the regular season while the Dodgers rest their regulars. Yarbrough will be out of action supposedly until Friday. Again, not a big deal. He'll be back with the team in Seattle. Yarbrough, for his part, said his newborn daughter and wife are healthy and happy. According to CBSSports.com, neither the Lakers nor the Clippers have anyone on their rosters that is a top 10 player in the NBA right now. For example, they believe that the best player on the Lakers is LeBron James, who they ranked 12th. That is the first time he has been out of the top 10 in their individual player rankings since his rookie year. Since his rookie year. Now, they tempered that by saying that James, provided he stays healthy and does what he does, could easily slide back into the top 10 next year. The reason that he and Anthony Davis, who is ranked 13th, by the way, aren't in the top 10 is obvious, availability. Matter of fact, they went so far as to say that you could bank on Anthony Davis missing 25 games this year, which is all interesting, but not nearly actually as interesting as where the Clippers players got ranked. Leonard dropped from eighth to 15th. Paul George is ranked 17th. Now the scribes love Paul George because he is willing to be the second option on the team absolutely willing to be a team player about it and frankly i find that respectable as well but the reason i am so interested in the clippers ranking is because shy gilgeus alexander if he were still with the clippers would be the best player on that roster right now according to cbs he's ranked 11th Here's what Gilgeus Alexander has. He's comfortable going to his left or his right. Defenders are worried about his pull-up, his step-back shot, his spin move, that he gets to the line because opposing teams can't keep him out of the paint because he's a little physical and quick, and he has amazing footwork when he gets there. Gilgeus Alexander's averaging 31 points per game, and he's becoming a better defender. And you traded Gilgeus Alexander and a fistful of draft picks to Oklahoma City in order to land Paul George. Damn. Former Sheffield United striker Billy Sharp is a legend to that team. Now, granted, Sheffield United is one of those teams that kind of bounces in and out of the Premier League. I love soccer. But not nearly as much as the British love soccer, let's be real. 
Sharp may have been the masterstroke of the Galaxy's midseason rebuild. Now, he hasn't played as many minutes as, say, new center back Maya Yoshida, but LA had a lot of trouble scoring goals, and Sharp solves that even in lim limited minutes. He scored on Sunday as well, the game tying goal in that uh, draw with St. Louis. But the British press have their pantaloons in a bunch because of what Galaxy fans serenade Sharp with when he scores. You know this if you're a regular soccer fan. Soccer fans are constantly singing praise of their own players, disrespecting other teams' players, etc. So for Billy Sharp, Galaxy fans will serenade him off of the song Baby Shark. Singing his name, do 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Now this really pissed off the Brits because they find the song cringy. And you know what? The song is cringy, but you guys over across the pond don't have squat to talk about because I don't know if there's been a single Brit who's been a musical sensation since the Spice Girls. I mean, for Pete's sakes, they're the Spice Grandmas right now. So you're going to lecture us about music? It's not exactly back in the day when you guys had the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. Oh, you guys could pop what counts as a collar over in that country as much as you like back then. But now, what's the, who's the biggest star from, the Brit, from Great Britain? Who is it? I mean, Sam Smith could carry a tune, but the last time I saw that guy, he looked like a plumber in a top hat. And you guys have the gall to lecture us about pop music? Turn, we like you guys. You're our allies. We got your back. But when it comes to that, turn around and walk away. Turn around and walk. By the way, uh, Sharp is actually looking forward to his first El Trafico. That's the next Galaxy match versus LAFC. Quote, the lads have told me it's hostile, which I quite like, unquote. I like that guy. Tom Bogert of The Athletic, uh, just like I did, have lamented the fact that the Galaxy had no choice but to move on from midfielder Efrain Alvarez. Bogert said, hey, man, it looked like that guy had been around forever with the Galaxy, and he's only 21, which makes sense, because the guy signed the contract to play for the Galaxy when he was 15. He has technically been around forever, but now he's heading to Club Tijuana after years of disappointment with the Galaxy, including just 10 appearances this year. Just 10 appearances. He scored, Alvarez scored just eight goals and 16 assists, in 104 career appearances. Now, Bogert, who is a pretty bright guy, I must tell you, he didn't give much of a reason as to why Alvarez fell from grace. He simply lamented it. I think I have a reason, but it's only, it's a vague reason. All I can tell you is what I saw when I watched Alvarez and the Galaxy warm up in Portland in a match earlier this year. If you've ever seen warm ups for a soccer game, this is a very heroic sport. And so you're constantly seeing the players do all these little dances with their feet, you know, trying to get their heart rate up, kicking the ball around. But even when they don't have possession of the ball in this little kicking around thing, they're constantly dancing their feet. Alvarez just stood there, flicked his foot. Eh. Eh. He wasn't trying to get his heart rate up. He wasn't even trying to get on the pitch. Everybody else, it looked like one of those dance party video games from a couple of decades ago. Alvarez is just, eh, eh. The guy just didn't want to be on the pitch. Simple as that. There is a tendency to overreact after week one in the NFL. Unless, of course, you're with the Jets. Then you get to overreact as much as you want after last night. Holy crap, you bastards are screwed. But when the Rams got... And I will tell you, I'm guilty of overreacting too. Last season, after the Rams got their ass kicked by Philadelphia in the season opener last year, I was about to take my life in the most violent way imaginable. I was so sad. But now the tables have turned. And ESPN came up with... Five reasons the Rams' offense can succeed without Cooper Cup. The top two reasons made no sense whatsoever. Straight up. The Rams, un un unlike what ESPN is saying, the Rams do not have a running game yet. Sure, Kyron Williams scored a touchdown. 
Cam Akers scored a touchdown, but Williams led the running game with 52 yards. So that's not a running game. Stop it. Stop it. Also, receiving depth. Stop it. No, that is not true. Not true. The games that Puka Nakua and Tutu Atwell had Sunday were career games for both of them. One game. Okay? That is not depth when you've had one really strong game. They've got to do more. That is not receiving depth. Now, what I completely agree with is Matthew Stafford being healthy is an absolute game changer. Long drives, I agree with that. You put together lengthy drives instead of quick strikes, keeps that young defense off the field. I agree with that too. But keep in mind, I was telling you guys this last week on Friday Night Chalk Talk, Seattle's pass rush barely gets a dent on anyone. The Rams are playing San Francisco. ESPN was praising the Rams' offensive line to keep a clean pocket. If the Rams' offensive line can do that against the San Francisco 49ers, now you're talking. Now you're talking. But we can't overreact after one game, ESPN. Prior to Sunday's game, Seattle's DK Metcalf said he could not name any of the Rams' defensive backs. Well, he knows one now if you watch the game. In his frustration, he committed a personal foul. He didn't get flagged for it. It wasn't seen. But he blatantly shoved a fellow Will, Will, Witherspoon in the back right to the turf. That's a personal foul. But on the plus side, in order to do that, you're doing it from behind. And you're reading Witherspoon across the back of the jersey. So unless Matt Metcalf is illiterate, he now knows the name of a Rams defensive back. Austin Eckler turned an ankle in Sunday's loss for the Chargers. It is unknown if he's going to practice this week. The LA Times rightfully credits Angel City FC coach Becky, interim coach Becky Tweed, for Angel City's good form that has lasted longer than two months. They have not lost since June when Tweed replaced Freya Coombe. Angel City is 7-0-3. The belief is that Tweed, it's not that she's been a master in-game tactician, but what she did instill in the team is a sense of guts, grit. Practices have apparently become very feisty. And she's also demanded that every player see themselves as a team leader. Now that might sound really simplistic, but I think it actually holds weight. Keep in mind, Angel City has lost a, a defender to an Achilles rupture and one of their main strikers to a knee injury. You need those reserves to act like team leaders in a situation like that. So yes, it does matter. Angel City is rallying behind its interim coach, Becky Tweed. Finally, UCLA football, to their credit, have played two decent opponents to start the season in Coastal Carolina and San Diego State. Dominant, no. Decent, yeah. So now the Bruins get an opponent they should absolutely squish in North Carolina Costa. Kelly was asked if he would rest the players, you know, Clippers load management style. He told the LA Times, quote, load management, that's an NBA term. We've got 12 games a year. There is no load management in college football, unquote. Coach Kelly, I appreciate that. But you guys let me know what you think in the comments thread. Talk to me about the Dodgers wiping the slate from Julio Arias. Tell me where you would put LeBron, Anthony Davis, Kawhi, etc. If you were ranking NBA players. And if you enjoyed the content, don't forget to subscribe to Faithful Angelinos. We're talking LA sports every single day here. Thank you for watching. I'm James. We'll be back tomorrow. Faithful Angelinos is a Kian Corte El Queso production. Take care.